Everyone's here. Wow. Who are these crazy people? Why would, why don't you have anything better to do? <laughs> <laughs> don't say that. Don't say that. Okay. <laughs> so it's uh, three o'clock here in Paris and uh, I guess it's two o'clock in the UK, Paul. Absolutely. Yeah. Paul, I'm very, very happy to, to have you today uh, with us uh, for this uh, webinar with a very, very uh, intriguing uh, title. But before we start, let us present a little bit uh, ourselves very quickly and um, very unpolitely, yeah, we start with me. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm the co-founder, I'm Pascal Bekash, and I'm the co-founder of uh, Digital Pharma Lab. Digital Pharma Lab is a, is a very nice um, uh, company, the leading company for um, the um, project acceleration in uh, between pharma tech startups and uh, pharmaceutical companies in Europe. Uh, we have today um, more than 40 uh, clients that are um, from uh, pharma and uh, medical devices companies. And uh, we have um, in our database in France and outside France around uh, 1,000 startups we, we work not today, every day with, but uh, <laughs> very, uh, very often. And, uh, and that we can present to, uh, to pharma companies. So uh, today pharma companies are very interested to, uh, to work with the startups because, uh, because, because Paul will explain why, probably. <laughs> and uh, so the comp our company exists for uh, now two years and uh, I'm the co-founder with Didier Tranchier who is also here. Uh, Paul, now it's your turn to, uh, in, well, you have uh, 30 seconds. <laughs> 30 seconds, uh, that's about 28 <laughs> longer than I deserve. Um, <laughs> I People probably know me as the former chairman at IFA Pharma or Reuters as it's now owned by, but uh, I guess I found my freedom earlier this year and uh, I'm now able to do really whatever I want. So that means working with some of the most um, exciting people to really drive this industry forward. I, I've always felt that we have an industry with so much potential unfulfilled. Uh, and we're actually a relatively young industry. People think we're very mature, actually against the sort of evolutionary cycle and how we, we are. We're very um, homogenous, or at least we have been, and uh, we're still yet to develop into what we could be. So uh, my mission these days is really all about working with the most exciting people to get new business models and new products and services out to the market that will make a difference to patients. Excellent. So uh, you have decided to, uh, to post a very, very, very uh, intriguing title. So yeah, did I come up with that title or did you? I can't remember. But anyway, let's go with it. You say, you say how far my company can achieve more by <laughs> earning less. Come on, yeah. what, what do you mean? <laughs> well, look, let me um, let's pretend let's pretend for a moment maybe some of you will like to pretend for a moment that you are Jeff Bezos from Amazon uh, yes you're a very very wealthy man and you're very lucky because your business happens to be online and 98% uh, of your competition just got shut down during lockdown and uh, two trillion dollars of revenue just got given by your president to families in the US. And uh, obviously many of these families are your customers. So they're gonna spend all that money on Amazon. And you are, well, if you're yeah, Jeff Bezos, you're probably laughing all the way to the bank uh, because you, know, you couldn't wish for a better scenario for your business. Um, and uh, then the first quarter 2020 payments, uh, uh, sorry, revenues uh, were announced. And what did Jeff, sa Jeff say? He said, hold them to your seats if you are an Amazon investor. And he said that because he announced that all of the 4 billion additional profit that people were expecting was actually being reinvested. It was being reinvested in creating effectively a COVID secure supply chain in hiring around about 200,000 new staff. That's a mind boggling amount. Um, they had about 600,000 before he chose that to do that. Uh, and uh, he absolutely took the view that a crisis is an opportunity, not just an opportunity, but an investment opportunity. This is the time to double down. This is a time to work out how we can gain leverage, not only just over our competitors, but also by providing greater value for customers also. So the profits didn't come. 
he did not earn uh, a huge amount of money to run to the bank. Of course, in subsequent um, uh, earnings calls, he, he has indeed uh, earned much more. Um, but the share price went up despite the fact that yet again, as is very common through Amazon's life cycle, the company did not earn a large profit. And he's very much trained his investors to, to, to be fine with that and to expect capital growth instead of dividends. So um, he basically decided that the world, this was not a year, 2020, this was not a year to make a huge amount of money. Uh, and I look at our industry pharmaceuticals and I see many, many problems with our customer base, obviously HCPs and doctors, many unresolved problems. And I see, uh, I talk to people every day, as you can imagine, I see a lot of people still standing on the, on the sidelines, if I'm honest. Um, they are still wondering what to do um, about this uh, pandemic situation. They haven't been able to put in any, any really solid strategic plans. Really, the focus has been on business continuity to date. And I already see this, we're you know, six months into lockdown now, I already see this as a massive missed opportunity for that greater investment in our customer base and where we need to be. I'm going to be disappointed, I feel, at the end of the year um, with some companies that have raised their profit level significantly without necessarily raising the value that they're providing for their customers accordingly. And ultimately, that is the biggest problem with healthcare. We, as an industry and as a, um, a wider sector of society, are the industry that has increased prices the most without a corresponding increase in value over the last decade. You could possibly argue that education is a similar, but that's a slightly smaller industry compared to us. So we, we, we should be taking this as an opportunity. People talk about reputation of our industry as being the thing that we can resolve, but I think it goes much further than that. We should not be uh, earning a lot. But yeah, but um, uh, allow me to be a little bit also provocative as you are, <laughs> but you know, some of the, these uh, pharma companies put a lot of money in, uh, for instance, uh, uh, vaccine research or uh, drugs against COVID. Yeah, I'm not really talking about the vaccine research. We were very responsive and I actually laud pretty much every effort that I've seen when it talked to the COVID-19, but 90% of us are not directly involved in the vaccine research. And that is unfortunately where I think we've actually been hiding behind our well-intentioned and well-doing well uh, colleagues in the same way that um, companies uh, like Google have been able to hide behind the wrongdoings of companies like Facebook. Uh, and uh, and uh, many believe that they would be held up to a more socially responsible eye were it not for other people doing worse than them. Here we're doing it the other way around, we're holding up the positive uh, work that people are doing for the vaccine and actually we are acting like laggards behind them in the vast majority of cases and um, you know as I say I speak to quite a wide spectrum of people. On average I've been more disappointed than, than happy with what I've seen. Do and you, then, do you, yeah, go on. Do you think that um, the company that are involved in uh, vaccine research, for instance, will, uh, at the end of the year or the two years, will finally achieve more, have more uh, a bigger valuation, uh, bigger capitalization on the market than the company that... Uh, possibly, possibly it would be a side effect. I mean, I, I, I genuinely believe that most of the people who are on the front lines of building vaccine research are doing so with a very... Um, open-minded and very well-meaning uh, 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 desire and, and they're not using it as an exploitative profit-making potential on that drug in particular. But what is very interesting is the side effects. So obviously we have a greater collaborative environment right now. We also have a new factor in market access. So to get a drug released, public perception has become far more of an important uh, consideration than it ever was before. So I wouldn't be surprised if that actually gets uh, brought into the formulae that the uh, market access people use when, when bringing their drugs on a far greater extent. Uh, I also think that the developing markets, although our focus right now is on where we live and our loved ones and our close ones, and most of the people watching this will be watching it from Europe or the U, uh, North America. So we care about our own society right now, but we're going to care a lot more about the developing societies. Uh, and I hope also to see a general shift in our priority towards that going on in the future as well. In actual fact, we'll probably have to because I don't think that we'll be able to rely on the same price margins in the US than we have done uh, in the past. And we're going to have to consider the rest of the world a bit more seriously going forward. But, but um, okay, so coming back to, um, to healthcare, uh, 
and, and especially uh, uh, digital health. Um, uh, do you think that, uh, do you think that, you know, obviously the, 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 the COVID crisis uh, accelerated the, the use of uh, digital in the, uh, in, in, in the field of healthcare, but do you think everybody will, would have benefited from it? Uh, yes and no. So um, I have another thing to say almost, which answers both the, your question now and the previous one. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a something around something that's very fashionable in our industry right now, which is the word agility. And agility is uh, something that we obviously desire for a very uncertain environment. That's the environment that we're going into. And it's obviously suitable for a digital environment. Again, what we're going into uh, and what, where we already are. The problem is that we haven't changed our KPIs and our targets. The whole point of what I was saying just in the last few minutes is that if we're still focused on revenues as our primary KPI, then we are not focused on agility by definition, because agility is something that is designed for learning, and learning is not the same as making money. And so when you ask me the question, will we benefit from a digital future going forward as a result of this pandemic? Yes and no. We will to a degree, of course we will, because everybody's working remotely and we've had to build in digital tools. But again, I see a massive gap with um, our inability to shift strategically onto finding metrics, not vanity metrics, but real metrics that show that we are learning as organizations. And actually startups are the best at this, because in most cases, startups don't have revenues and they're not going to get revenues anytime soon. How do they make themselves investable? They need to find metrics and show progress that shows that they are learning organizations even before they make any revenues. They need to show that they can convert customers for a lower amount of money. They need to show that they can retain customers for a lower amount of money, even if those customers aren't even real customers yet. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of metric that we need to adopt within pharma on a much stronger basis. Otherwise, we won't. We simply won't. Uh, exploit the digital opportunity as well as we could. But do you think that the healthcare professionals are today all ready uh, to embrace uh, digital? I mean, I mean, if um, uh, pharma industry is, is putting a lot of money, you know, uh, mm -hmm. pretend, let's pretend that the pharma, the pharma industry, the healthcare industry is going to put a lot of money as you wish. Uh, do you think that healthcare professional will be able to uh, uh, to use all these uh, uh, good news, etc., or are they are they a little bit laggard as well? I think you have a spectrum in any industry. Healthcare professionals have historically been one of the fastest adopters of technology. I remember when iPads came in, the doctors were the ones who bought them. Um, the uh, and I think that the healthcare systems themselves, in many ways, on a personal level, are, are absolutely poised to, to, to and, and are taking advantage of technology. Of course, there is a lot of systemic problems, as with any large organization. I happen to live in the UK. We have the NHS, one of the largest organizations in the world. Uh, something like two in 50 um, people in the UK are employed by the NHS. So... Um, to expect a, an organization like that to be able to innovate when margins are so critical is very low. This is the, exactly the kind of investment that I think we in pharma can be making. It's the kind of support, the digital support. It doesn't have to be providing them with computers. It can be providing advice, know-how, providing systemic solutions to problems, joined up thinking. We as pharma companies, we've already seen it starting. We're going to move away from being single company organizations to more coalition. My friend Brian Smith would call it a hollow biont because he's a, a very clever academic. Uh, and what that means, it's like a, it's, it's, you know, the, the edges of the organization have become a lot more fuzzy. If we look at what patients need and we work backwards from that, we need to provide a coalition response to that need. So that coalition effort to help healthcare is what's going to create the benefit that we need. I'm, I'm very happy to be honest that you use uh, this world coalition and, and uh, for the, the audience, we, we didn't prepare this one. 
<laughs> we didn't prepare at all. <laughs> uh, and and um, uh, you know, in France, we 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 have set up um, a coalition um, uh, of pharma companies and to 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 make sure that um, you know these pharma companies could uh, um, find new innovative projects for uh, the healthcare system, generally speaking, during the COVID crisis and especially during the lockdown. And um, it has been a very, very interesting and very uh, generous response and the kind of response you are, uh, you are wishing. And I like also your idea that uh, pharma companies, DM in, uh, the medical devices industry also can be an agent, a, a very powerful agent of change uh, for the, the whole stakeholders, the, the whole the stakeholders of uh, the healthcare system, including the HTP, the patients, etc. So. I like very much what you, what you just said. Yeah, it's not easy. Our companies are not designed, you know, imagine a CRM system that's being shared with multiple organizations. It's a very difficult thing for us to do. Compliance, protocol, technology, there's going to be big challenges. But this is a trend that's already started. You can see that most large companies are actually splintering into individual smaller organizations. So we've created those coalitions within a single brand, if you like, an umbrella brand. Probably the best example of it is Rovent Sciences, where they never even created the, the big group in the first place. They started off by creating lots of small companies underneath their umbrella, uh, and they're doing quite well. So, um, yeah, I see it as inevitability. I won't be able to tell you how quickly it will come, but it is an inevitability. Great. Thank you very much for this. And uh, just a small commercial here. We are uh, launching a coalition <laughs> yeah. uh, in France and in Europe, so everybody... Yeah. Uh, it's Every why day. what you're doing is so important. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you very much. So uh, coming back to you, um, is, in, in your opinion, uh, you say earning less, we understand why. In, in, actually, you should have said invest more <laughs> rather than earning less, but you are provocative. So uh, now what about achieve more? Is digital a way to achieve more? Uh, well, I've already touched on how we need to change some of the targets to enable digital to achieve more. But I also think that we need to raise our ambitions a little bit, I would have to say. Uh, most of what we call a digital transformation, I'm already quite sick of this phrase, uh, in our industry is, I would call it Web 1.0. Like we sometimes describe our industry as Pharma 3.0, 4.0. No, it's not. We're still stuck on 1.0. 1.0 is when you are turning non-digital things digital we are replicating processes and that's what we've effectively done at fast speed over the last few months uh, for many offline processes um but web 1.0 was the dear it was the era of aol and geo cities and things like that on on, on the web do you remember those they, they were really just fancy brochures yes they provided benefits if you ran a hotel it would be much more beneficial for you to put up a website so you can attract more visitors um, to, to, to find out about your hotel. But those business models have disappeared now. You know, many of those companies that existed in, you know, the late 1990s and early 2000s do not exist anymore. And that's because Web 2.0 models, i.e. digital native models, have superseded them. We have not yet progressed to that level. Um, perhaps the, 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 the best example of where we've got close is in better use of real world evidence and, and using that uh, to, to drive and discover value. Um, that's probably the only example of a, a digital only business model that I can think of that we've adopted within our industry. The rest of it is actually still quite basic. You know, I sound very critical here. I realize that um, it's very easy for me to snipe from the sidelines. And I realize that, you know, in a compliance heavy and difficult environment, that's um, that's always going to be the way. But what I do think, as I said at the beginning, is that we have to raise our ambitions. There is nobody, unfortunately, that could be described as a healthcare leader or a, a real leader of our industry today that has produced what I would describe as a very compelling vision as to what healthcare could look like a few years from now. All of the corporate communications are around things that have happened in the past or which are happening now. There's very little um, and ironically, we see that from the tech giants, the tech industry, some of those uh, leaders are actually very good at this. Um, perhaps they're even cavalier. You would describe Elon Musk, for example, as perhaps going a little bit too far the other way. But um, a lot of these people are very good at getting us excited, at um, 
creating a compelling vision of the future. And in so many cases, that vision of the future is just a more interoperable version of the future. It's not even about new ideas and new technologies, it's about the existing ones just working better. Uh, and, uh, and, and just being able to visualize that um, is, is really important. We don't see that happening in our industry very much. And you know, some of these tech companies actually do this strategically. They don't just do it for their own fame. They do it because, you know, I used Amazon earlier as an example. Amazon is known for being able to destroy an entire industry in three press releases. Uh, and it did so when it bought Whole Foods and it killed the uh, market value of every other grocery store in the US for a significant period of time just by entering that market. And um, what they do, of course, is they produce a compelling vision of the future and they use that story to drive the value of their company. Um, Tesla is the perfect example of a story stock, as I would call it, and perhaps, again, an overinflated, but that allows them very cheap access to capital. That allows them to be able to enter markets like healthcare without having to make a profit. So now Amazon's forays into healthcare, they may have stumbled a little bit. We haven't seen as much as we hope to yet, but they, can, they have a massively superior advantage over anybody else simply because they're able to talk up a good story. So this kind of um, narrative that we need to produce actually has a very strategic role if we are able to think up in a joined up way uh, about it. Okay. So let's break for, uh, let's say, uh, five to 10 minutes, not breaks. Oh, we have a question, and, and not because you have to, to, to finish your, uh, your lunch, but because we have question, we have plenty of questions. And so um, I, I guess our uh, attendants would be happy if you can uh, answer some. So do it briefly if you can, and then we will come back to, to your uh, lecture. Sure. So um, uh, Carol asks you, how can uh, we solve the issue of accessi accessing health records directly between pharma and hospitals, since some countries that have strict regulation on, access, uh, on accessing hospital records, meaning we cannot fully go digital because we need still some data we, can, we yeah. cannot try to collect. This is a perfect example of where it's very easy for me to say, let's do this, and it's very difficult in reality to make it happen. The truth is that um, being able to use healthcare records in a de-identified way to the extent that we wish to is right now, today, not possible. And we have a very entrenched industry of electronic patient records, et cetera, who are uh, trying very hard to hold on to, uh, you know, they make all the right noises, but the reality is they hold on to their data. They make it proprietary, they make it difficult to use, they make it non-transferable between different places, uh, at least not digitally anyway. And uh, we actually need for our leaders perhaps to make some progress here. We're obviously about to go into an election in the US. Um, we need to raise the importance of this issue perhaps as an industry. Um, because, you know, I listened to an interview last week with um, Eric Schmidt, the former uh, chairman of Google, uh, and like, like so many of us, he believes that the biggest industry rises over the next decade will be in healthcare, if we can solve this problem. This is the thing that is holding us back. Interoperability, in my opinion, is the biggest sure. barrier we have to progress in our industry today, beyond anything else. So... Um, yeah, I don't have an easy answer, but we need to put pressure <laughs> on those above us who can solve it. Okay. Uh, there, there is another question from Nilo. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to the KPIs for a moment. How does the industry get over the innovators dilemma, given that most companies uh, focus on revenue, profitability, as you have rightly highlighted? Yeah. Um, when I answer this question, I find myself thinking back to a very bad incident that happened in London at the end of last year in the old world, if you can even remember that. And it was a terrorist incident when uh, a man uh, killed two people with a knife. Um, but actually, he probably would have killed 50 people if it wasn't for two other people who just members of the public who suppressed this guy and fought him, even though he was wearing a suicide vest and obviously wielding his knife. They just grabbed whatever weapons they could and they wrestled this guy to the ground until the police came uh, and they were risking their own lives in that entire process. There are people in our society who are just a little bit like this. In fact, we tend to call them entrepreneurs. They are willing to look stupid. They are willing to do things that are self-sacrificial. 
they're willing to endanger uh, themselves just because they believe in their idea or they believe in a different way of doing things. Every company, even a pharma company, has these kind of people within them. And I think it's absolutely necessary for our leaders to stop trying to use their experience to judge whether ideas are good or not. Because all new ideas look like a toy. That's a, you know, the uh, person who quoted the question mentioned the innovator's dilemma. That's a quote from Christian Claytonson who wrote that book. Um, all innovations look stupid when you first see them. This is why Blockbuster laughed at Netflix, right? It's why so many examples in history have been dismissed by the industry incumbents. It's not down to us as leaders to decide what innovation is good. It's down to the market. That's why we need agility. That's why we need a learning organization that learns from the market, not learns from how many years your CEO or higher up has been in office for. That's not going to decide whether an innovation is successful or not. So we need to get out of the way. Well, the CEOs are not alone. They have a lot of investors, including uh, small investors like, investors like you and me, uh, shareholders. So uh, sometimes we, we, want, we would prefer money rather than... Uh, uh, True, but good investors. Yeah, good but investors. Another story, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good investors know what good metrics and yeah, good yeah. business models look like, even before they've become successful. They okay. let the market decide. <laughs> another question from Bart. Uh, yeah. I, I have a, a, an avalanche of questions, so I will. I, I just uh, want to to apologize because probably I, I can't ask all the questions because we we will need to to come back to your lecture. Right. So, so it's good to leave the audience wanting more at the end of a gig. <laughs> okay. let's, uh, let's, let's ask some question then um so uh, you know uh, we we know we all know the 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 more low the more low sorry the more low yeah yeah the more low and uh, but we know that um uh we know that you know uh, thanks to uh, uh this low and, and and the rest you know the acceleration of uh, um, information system and IT uh, drug discovery in five years will be much much less costly, um, and open data, open collaboration will challenge the current IP-based drug business models. Will pharma react defensively or grab the opportunity uh, to move the economic value creation on the next level? In your opinion, um, so. Pharma development has followed the inverse of Moore's law to date, and it's becoming more and more expensive. And the reason is partly because medicines are becoming more sophisticated, and that's because we have found the cures to the easy diseases so far. That's actually true. Um, so I'm not entirely sure I agree with the question of that, that neural networks are going to necessarily drop the price. Of course, I have a lot of hope and faith that AI is going to be a massive game changer and already it is showing some promise in R&D, but we're not there yet. I believe that pharma's smartest way of uh, making drug discovery more profitable and more, more uh, amenable going forward is to externalize it as much as possible to create exactly what I spoke before, the kind of hollow biont, uh, fuzzy edge business model. Mm -hmm. Effectively, we can use the biotech industry as our R&D playground and um, we only fund what is successful. Yes, we'll end up paying more money for those successful drugs because we're having to pay the founders that created them uh, in the first place, um, but that's still far less costly than paying for the 90% failure rate that we have in clinical trials. I believe that there's actually a couple of different business models around this area, which we need to explore. I'm not gonna go into them now because it takes me at least 10 minutes to, to explain them. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if you wanna go that way. <laughs> Looks like you're running out of battery there. On please make sure you uh, you keep your battery charger on. But um, yeah, sorry for will that. pharma react defensively or grab the opportunity that moves the economic value creation on the next level? Pharma is yet to stare at the abyss, and that's another reason why we haven't had as much innovation as we hope. So as we get closer to the abyss, you would hope that the industry would be more innovative and more willing to try new things, and I very much believe that that will be the case. If it's a natural yeah. phenomenon. Um, but I, I'm not yet convinced that neural networks are okay. going to provide a 50 okay. times increase in the pace of drug discovery. I think the jury okay. is still out on that one. Okay, some other question, and I will ask the audience to just slow a little bit down the, the rhythm of the... <laughs> no, 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 let them cover. We just don't have to go. Uh, I can, okay. I can um, answer them all uh, after. 
the things to say, there will be uh, <laughs> some other questions. So I have a very a very quick question. It's from uh, Florent uh, from Grenental, and I, I don't say that because in French, but it, it's a very uh, short question. I like it very much. How can managers that are still in 1.0 in digital acumen even drive a 2.0 thinking? I mean, it's a very good question. I like it very much. What do you think? How can a child drive a car? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the answer is probably that they shouldn't. Uh, so, and I realize I'm being very rude by describing everybody as children just there. But the point is that we have to become more attractive places to work for the sorts of people that can drive our 2.0 thinking. Uh, how do we become more attractive places to work? Well, we need to do exactly as I said before, have the kind of stories and narrative of future vision um, and uh, adherence to an agile workplace that actually does attract those kind of people. We work in the most emotive and important industry on the planet. We have no excuses for not being able to grab people's attention and social good, social values into our organizations. We're just not very good at telling the story. We're scared to put our head above the parapet for fear that we'll get shot down, laughed at, whatever it is. This is why I think that right now, this is an age of entrepreneurship, not an age of incumbent leadership, where we actually need to give some of those people who are willing to run towards the fire, willing to um, stop a terrorist from causing more harm, who are naturally that way inclined to actually have more power and responsibility within the organization. And that's very hard for the leaders to do because they have to take a step back. Okay. Um, another question, sorry, I... Um... I will uh, give some advantage to, to my French friends. So from Olivier uh, from Servier, that- uh, uh, Good Olivier is here. He's a very good friend as well. Yeah. Uh, you raise very interesting points, Paul. So thank you, Olivier. Let's say the genuine, that genuine digital healthcare is what our society and healthcare professional need now. Given the uh, chism that you described between the existing pharma and what it should do, how do you see pharma contributing here? So can you just read part of that question again? Because I can't quite, I can't see it. So uh, you look at, the, at the Q and R, not the, yeah. the Q and R. Okay, I can't see it, but just just maybe just say the last, the, 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 the first half of the question again, if, if that's okay. So um, the, the genuine, the, let's say that genuine digital healthcare is what our society and healthcare professional need now. Okay, mm -hmm. but given the, I, I think the, the the schism, the the the, the gap, the gap <laughs> that you described yeah. between the existing pharma and what it should do, mm -hmm. how do you think that a pharma company can can contribute? How how are they are contributing here? Uh, okay, well, um, I think I've sort of answered that question um, a little bit when I answered Florence's question in terms of how do we get leaders to be more Web 2.0 minded. Uh, the answer is they probably, you know, they can learn, but they have to make way for others. And the second thing is, I mean, the real answer to Olivier's question is start with the customer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Start with the target that you intend to and work backwards from there. We do too much of our innovation starting with where we are as companies now and thinking, right, what can we do that's going to be of value? This is the opposite way around from how we need okay. to think. Okay. Good, good, good suggestion. Knowing Olivier, I know very well Olivier, I know he's in, in this. Uh, he's he's yeah. more forward thinking than most already. So uh, he probably knows the answer. Exactly. Uh, another question uh, for you from Carlos. Do you think that uh, this is the best moment to change the whole pharmaceutical marketing and sales model? Or... Or, or keep know. it. <laughs> uh, I think that um, there are some opportunities within commercialization that are fairly tactical rather than strategic. Do I think that the whole thing needs to be replaced? I think that there are some huge shortcuts that we can make. There are companies like Datavent, part of the Royvent Sciences Empire, that are finding incredible ways to uh, shortcut so many of the processes and costs that we have. I think there are companies that take a different approach to uh, CRM that is far more customer experience oriented and far more integrated, like uh, Indigene and Omnipresence. I think that there are companies that are using AI in very clever ways to 
uh, and re-empower the sales reps and sales forces and to, to reimagine how that can actually look in a far smarter way. All of these things are relatively uh, tactical uh, and they're necessary. Uh, I don't know if it counts that they are completely reimagining what is commercialization right now. What I do think is that companies who are looking for it, you know, companies who've come up with a new drug, they are right now they're forced to either sell their entire new drug to a big pharma company or a digital therapeutic, by the way, works as well. They sell their entire IP to a, to a pharma company and the, and the pharma company takes it to market or they try to build their entire commercialization department themselves. I think that neither of these two options are wonderful. They've been the only two options for, for many decades. I think a third option is emerging. Uh, and I think that there are a couple of pioneers, one of which is a company called Eversana. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, there are other sort of precursors to this model. And I believe that that model will be a, a genuine web 2.0 model um, if it exists. And it basically involves companies working in partnership and not owning the drug themselves. So if, if you can imagine, Uber doesn't own the taxis. Oh, Airbnb yeah. doesn't own the properties. Yeah. How do we create a, an Uber model within pharma where um, there's an organized, a new kind of pharma company that doesn't own the, um, doesn't own, yeah, I know it's, it's, trust me, I'm using a different way of the cl classic Uber cliche here. This is different. This is different. This is different. How do we create a, a new kind of pharma company which doesn't own the drugs, which instead acts as the development and commercialization partner to those who came up with the drug in the first place? That's a web 2.0 model that is emerging and is actually happening in reality now, but it's early days as to whether or not it becomes a significant part of our industry or not. Okay. Violetta has a question for you. Um, uh, a lot of pharma bashing, I'll say, well, let's say this way. I thought we were, I thought we had pharma people on the, uh, on the, on the, on the call here. The environment uh, within pharma company is, is really uh, a failure when it comes to really adopt digital and technology. Uh, I missed the first part. So something about pharma being a failure to adopt digital and technology. Yeah, the, the mindset uh, and the environment within pharma companies. Is, is pharma, it... pharma is necessarily a very conservative and safe industry. It has to be. It's no surprise that a, an industry that has depended almost entirely on the quality of its drugs from its entire history is a very conservative, conservative and safe industry. Now we see that new value is being made from the service element, from the digital element, from that. And that, of course, requires a more experimental attitude. But you're asking people who've grown up in one system to now adopt a new system. It's totally understandable that we've been very slow in that uh, incorporation. Um, but, you know, let's stop complaining about it. Yeah. Let's look at the future okay. and figure out how we can make this leopard change its spots. Hmm. We, we have said about the, the future of healthcare, we, everybody say that the patient is uh, in, the, in the center, the, the patient will guide the way, etc. Is that something you agree with? Yeah, I believe that the patient power will continue to increase. I actually believe that one day patients will create their own medicines. Again, a slightly controversial idea, <laughs> but um, we've already seen a lot of, you know, think about the movie industry. Once upon a time, to make a movie, you had to be a gazillionaire. Nowadays, you can upload a video on TikTok and become just as famous as any, as any movie director. Why? Because the tools have become easier, they've become more pervasive, but also the rules of the game have changed. So I believe that patient, that regulations will evolve as well. And regulations will evolve so that there's necessarily more patient involvement in the creation of medicines and their approval. And so they should be. The first phase, of course, is what we see already, patient advocacy, patient engagement, patient understanding, using good design principles to understand how to create uh, a, a new medicine. The second phase will be where patients actually can take more control. Um, and I'm not advocating that we destroy the FDA here. In fact, I wrote on LinkedIn recently about how Donald Trump should not be promoting an un licensed medicine as he did when he came out of hospital um, and that we need to uphold the values of the uh, expert-led FDA process but I definitely see that that process will evolve it will become grayer it will 
uh, enable patients to have more choice, uh, expert-led choice or data-led choice, um, and that we're going to see a blurring of that boundary. Um, eventually, we will see patients making more of the decisions themselves, perhaps with a digital companion. I believe in the digital twin, the digital companion to help guide you into whether a, a choice is sensible or not. Okay. Another question from, um, uh, what's his name? Sorry, I was a little bit, from Michael, Michael Sliger. Um, Michael spent 25 years, even more in uh, pharma industry, the like six months as chief commercial officer in a small startup. And his biggest learning is that pharma's biggest barrier to successfully change uh, and to successful change and evolution is the sheer size of their organization, layers, committees, people looking to justify their existence, et cetera, et cetera, silo, all in part a result of a massive profit margin and fat in the organization's budget. So how do you compel leaders in organization to shed people, their friends, whose families would be impacted in the interest of organizations greater good Good question. I like it also. <laughs> good question. It's a little bit pain. No, I'm joking. Um, it's a good question. Uh, it's very hard to get rid of your friends. Uh, and I don't think that we can rely on natural processes to do that because people will always be loyal to their friends. Um, you may have noticed that as soon as Iperpharma became owned by a larger company, Reuters, I exited because uh, I too am not one for playing all of the polit political games that, uh, that come with larger organizations. But the truth is, split into smaller organizations. It's the only way. Uh, I mentioned that Pfizer has done a very good job of this recently. If you look at Albert uh, Boiler's um, uh, recent posts on LinkedIn, you'll see one from about two or three weeks ago where he explained how the, uh, his model has changed. Um, you obviously saw companies like Novartis making significant cuts. AstraZeneca, I believe, is also on the way to doing that. Um, you have to create smaller and more nimble organizations uh, and each one needs to be completely accountable for its own livelihood uh, and that's where real responsibility will, will come from it's too easy to hide it's too easy to, to be fat as, as the questioner puts it so um, I, I don't think that there's a tactical answer to this question I think it has to be again a very strategic one um, Rovent Sciences I think has a lot of mileage I'm not sure they've taken the right approach in terms of obtaining the drugs that they've got but they, they started off by saying, we're gonna create a new company for every therapy area we wanna be in with its own CEO and its own leadership. And right. that's what they've done. Okay, okay. listen, uh, there are some uh, also um, uh, commentaries like uh, you look great, so uh, I will leave it with you. I'm glad you read that one out. That one was very important. Although Jessica, you don't have to thank the camera for, for <laughs> those kind of praises anyway. Okay. So you have a personal admirer, so um, I can say anything here. <laughs> Uh, but there is a good question from Frank, and Frank, thank you very much, Frank Jungst. Thank you uh, very much for asking it, because actually it was, uh, it was a question I wanted to ask Paul, so, uh, so mm -hmm. I take yours. Uh, give us your first three main actions um, in, in the field and topics to start transforming the business. My question was a little bit different. If you are going to become a CEO of a large pharma company, what are you going to do in the next 90 days, which is a question from Frank. Firstly, whoever hired me as the CEO to run that company needs to be fired because that's a stupid choice. But um, uh, after that action, um, probably the first thing I would do is uh, something I mentioned earlier, change the targets, change the metrics that we're using within the organization towards more learning and less vanity metrics. So particularly at the moment, this is a time for investment. This is a time for learning. I would much favor a company that's learned how to survive in a post-COVID environment than I would over one that's made a lot of money in 2020 at the expense of patients and doctors. So I would remove those targets and change them. Uh, the next thing I would do is I would try to break down as many silos as possible. I realize, again, easier said than done, but let's be honest with you, the answer for personalization, which is still the holy grail of commercial departments, is to get departments working together. So, and when I say departments, of course, I also mean data working together. So that's uh, absolutely something that needs to happen. And then finally, I would do, again, something I've mentioned is to have a bit more vision and ambition. I actually have this thing I've invented. I call it the four A's. 
Um, the first A is ambition. If you start with an ambitious goal, then that drives the second A, which is attention. If you have an ambitious goal, it naturally attracts more attention. Putting a man on the moon attracted a lot of attention. That attention is what creates the accountability. You can't hide if you've got a lot of attention on you. Um, climate change is the perfect example of this. The first uh, major agreements, cutting, uh, cu cutting carbon emissions by 50%. That is a huge and ambitious lofty goal. Okay, so they gave us a lot of years to do that in, but such a big goal is what drove that attention and the accountability. And finally, the accountability is what drives the action. So you've got the four A's there. If you don't start with an ambition in the first place, then you're not going to drive the right action at the end of the day. Great. So uh, um, you, have an, um, you have a big ambition for uh, pharmaceutical ind industry. You are going to be appointed CEO in a short amount of time, if I understand that. Yeah. Sure. I, I know that there are some people on this call who, uh, who uh, <laughs> make important hiring decisions, and uh, they're probably <laughs> laughing very loudly right now. Okay, great. Um, I must say it was very, uh, very, very, very interesting and, uh, and very, uh, let's say, uh, uh, enthusiastic. Uh, you, you are enthusiastic, but we are enthusiastic. Uh, how are we? Enthousi enthused? Is that the word? <laughs> we're all we're all just excited. Maybe that's the right thing. <laughs> Etc. Um, there are some other questions before we we leave you uh, go away. Mm -hmm. um, the the question from um, from uh, Miguel. Uh, what is your recommendation to concil conciliate the two forces inside pharma companies, industrial business model focus on production versus service business model? Well, start with the customer is the easy answer so the decision as to whether to prioritize one or another depends on what you have to do but what i want companies to do and what i will campaign for companies to do is to focus on the capabilities that they need as opposed to actually building the products and services because capabilities are going to last a lot longer and capabilities are not just the skills of the people it's the organizational capabilities as well companies are very good at manufacturing, they're very good at drug discovery, they're average at commercialization, um, and they are terrible at um, creating um, customer focused, um, oh, sorry, patient focused, extensive solutions partnering with other companies. So they need to develop the capability to do that. They need to be much better at partnership creation. They need to be able to, to do that. There are industries like aerospace and automotive that rely far more than we do on partnership approaches to the creation of their products. You know, cars are barely made by the BMW or the Ford badge. They're made by a huge network of suppliers underneath them, uh, unlike pharma. So they've developed very high capabilities around partnership in creation, uh, both on the research and the manufacturing and the development side. So we have to be better at this. Michael Porter, the famous um, American economist, said that companies make, invent, or sell, and they can't do all three. So they have to focus on one or the other. Yeah. I think that, the, um, that we have been an industry that's focused so much, in, so much on the making and creating that we don't know very much about the other parts. And that's why we need to work with partners to actually fulfill that ambition. Our huge vertically integrated companies are probably not the right business model for the long term. Okay. Um, there is a good question from Carol because we, we very often um, suggest that uh, big, you know, pharma, pharma industry is, is only in the hand of large pharma companies, but there are a lot of small pharma companies and small startups. Uh, and this is very difficult to, to, to break the barrier and to, to, to become uh to to become uh, bigger and bigger so uh, uh what makes it so challenging in your opinion to break this barrier and why can't people recognize great quality work faster what's your why advice? does a small pharma company want to break the barrier what's the barrier you want to become a bigger pharma company you want to be noticed by a bigger pharma company you want to be you know i'm not uh i'm not not entirely sure what the desire is behind the question and and why you want to break that we've already discussed how it might be better to stay smaller uh and stay more um, <laughs> nimble as a result um in terms of 
small companies just growing and becoming better. I mean, I don't think they have any different challenges from the large pharma companies. As I've just said, large pharma companies are splitting themselves into smaller entities of smaller companies anyway, because that actually works better. So I think I need a bit more detail from the questioner to be able to, to answer that properly, I'm afraid. Okay, okay. So uh, Ellie, I couldn't uh, hear you loud and clear during the 4A, especially the fourth one. So can you repeat <laughs> uh, that? The, So ambition drives attention and that drives accountability and then that drives finally action. Putting a man on the moon or the climate change or even when Jeff Bezos said, we're gonna have the drone deliveries, right? He said, we're gonna deliver your packages by drone. What a crazy idea, what a crazy ambition to have your, you know, and it doesn't matter that they don't exist, but the, the fact is that such a weird and crazy uh, 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 idea drove attention. That then drove the actual accountability. And now everybody's trying to make sure that Amazon actually does this, even though it's a stupid idea and it will never really happen. <laughs> so, um, you know, you don't want to have drones crashing above your head while you're walking down the street. Um, you, need to, you need to start with that ambition in order to drive better action. And um, few people do this in our industry, unfortunately. Okay, two last questions and afterward we will... Uh... Resume. So uh, the first the first question is uh, uh, the, the the problem is pharma is it seems that pharma industry is not very um, listened to uh, uh, when it comes to a disease education. Uh, pharma disease. doesn't deserve to be listened to. Sorry, but pharma doesn't deserve it. Okay. Yes, they have the best science. Yes, they have all of the the, the knowledge, but they haven't created transparent human-like company you know it's a bit like saying why don't you listen to the crazy person on the other side of the street well it's because you don't understand them you don't you don't see the trans you don't feel any uh, connection to that to that person so you're not going to listen to them pharma does not deserve it. our leadership hides we put ourselves in ivory towers we hide away we talk about science centricity as it were that's really what we are as science centric companies we're not really patient-centric companies um, and we should be um, we should be uh, far more vocal about what is an emotive area of the world and we're not very good at it okay okay you start with the you, you say start with the customer a question from uh from my, i cannot see uh isn't that one of the problems uh is um, the patient is not the customer or the payer well, pharma does have that slightly uh, insulated um, situation where, where, where we don't see what patients' lives are really like. I actually think that um, we're in a difficult situation right now because whilst COVID-19 has meant that all of our communication is digital, it's actually lowered the barriers to communication. It's easier maybe even to talk to patients than it was before. The quality of the conversation is going down. I believe that we need to embrace design as a principle much more in our industry. I used to be a designer, so I'm naturally very um, uh, positive. I see the good designer as someone who on the one hand goes to the depth of understanding the customer, the patient, whoever it is that's gonna be using whatever is being designed. And on the other hand, when it comes to the solution, goes the other way and f uses their imagination and creativity and artistry to come up with the best answer. So basically we and pharma, we're kind of in this narrow zone in the middle. We don't go too far in terms of understanding and we don't go too far in terms of solution. A good designer goes to the extremes to really make sure that they've got the best understanding and the best and most creative solution. That is the sort of ability, capability that we need to develop. Very hard to do when you're talking to everybody through Zoom calls. It requires taking a more ethnographic approach to the sort of questions that we answer and the sort of understanding that we get out of it. So I believe that design should become part of our language in our industry and currently it isn't. Again, this is where startups can be very helpful because they are not constrained by the same sorts of thinking that pharma companies have been. I couldn't agree more, so <laughs> I... <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry for not being as provocative and controversial as I need to be. Uh, I'll try and say some crazier things if you like. That's, that's, 
Great. So first of all, I want to uh, to, to to thank all the um, attendees for uh, asking uh, great questions. It was very interesting, and thank you, uh, Paul, for uh, accepting this very uh, interactive session. Um, I also I so want to 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 say that uh, uh, Digital Pharma Lab, of course, is uh, uh, is absolutely a fa great fan of startups and. Uh, uh, startups working with uh, large pharma companies because we we absolutely agree on what you just said. Uh, so uh, if you want to to try the ex and experience it, just join the the movement and join the coalition. Uh, Paul, uh, I I really thank you very much for your time for uh, uh, the time you spent in preparing it. I know uh, that uh, you 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 slept uh, not not too well uh, yesterday night. <laughs> Um, but I, <laughs> but, <yeah. laughs> but, but it was absolutely great. Um, thank you very much. You you are more than welcome to to come back to to on your on our channel. And, thank you. I I really enjoy um, our conversations to date, and I think your organisation is doing some great things. I'm also very grateful to the completely mad people who should be doing real work instead of listening to me droning on. Um, but um, very appreciative of this opportunity all the okay. same. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, thanks to you, everybody. And uh, stay, stay safe. Goodbye. <laughs> stay safe. Bye-bye.